And I wanted to ask before we get into some of the video stuff, what, you know, what do you think? And you've talked about some of the elements, but what do you, I mean, what do you think separates a good immigration law firm from others in terms of client experience and really how that relates to growing the business? You know, there's aspect of just knowing the law because it's a complicated area of law, spending a lot of time studying and being aware of it, not to mess things up or cause delays uh, unexpectedly. Um, and then it's just caring about people, um, not looking at them like uh, just another you know number that's coming in, which happens in, in every professional field where you're doing volume. Um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, just saying no, drawing the line. Maybe you get a lot of cases, but you say no to some of them because your plate is too full so that you don't ruin the experience for the people so there's losses that you endure when you do a model like this um i'm spending too much time in a case so it's cost the case is becoming less productive um, less value to it or i take on too many cases so i'm stretched thin so each person gets hit with it and doesn't give me time to do a continued education as well so um the key is you take a financial hit but it's it's not even a hit, it's an investment. It's like taking the money I would have got from that, investing it and paying off 10 years from now. So by like, you know, maybe making less money right now or spending more time on a client right now, it's going to create more and more clients where later on when I have a team and I train them in the right way, uh, we can handle more and make more income. So it's a long-term investment and it's, it's, it's long, it's, you know, thinking long-term or short-term, you know, and that's really about it. You know, in 10 years from now, what what's going to happen if we keep this model going, even though in the short term, it's making less money, um, it, it, how will it pay off in the long term? And it's a gamble, just like when you invest in a, buying a house or, or a stock and stuff like that. But, it, it, you know, this phrase has been around forever. Uh, but I heard Beyonce once say, she's like, if I'm going to bet on somebody, I'm going to bet on myself. And when I heard that, I said, I got to quit my own firm because um, at the end of the day, I, I, I want to bet on what I'm doing and the things I have and I think are true. And I can't do that someone else's firm because it's always you know, either they're not going to institute it. Or it's going to be partial or I have to listen to someone else. or I can't do it the way I want. I really believe in this. And whether it makes money or not, I want to practice law this way because I think it's the correct way to do it because I'm in the business of helping people and I got to do it the right way. Uh, and you know, it worked, it worked. I was, it was a good bet that I made. Um, then there's all the headache of and troubles of learning how to manage a business that's separate from law. And that's what the, my experience has been the last two or three years, but the level of service and the marketing, uh, they came on their own pretty naturally over time, over a short time, the management stuff, I was kicking and screaming. I didn't want to do it because I thought how much headache it would be. But actually when I started, I, it's very exciting. It's a new skill to learn. So I'm very enthusiastic about it now, but it took 10 years for me to give in and want to do it. Um, and now I'm like, oh, I should have done this five, six years earlier. I, I would have been more successful and reached my, my ideal goals faster. But I was afraid of hiring and the, and the fear of like, you know, just having employees. It's just scaling. It's a, it's a, yeah. scaling. So, and, and I talked with a lot of firms and I was full solo, like people who are like 20 people, 40, 50 people. And all of them would say, oh, I remember those days. It was so great. I sometimes wish <laughs> it was back to those days. Right. And they would say this stuff to me. And I'm like, well, maybe I should keep it like this. But then, especially when the pandemic happened, I'm like, listen, if I get sick and I'm out for a month or I die, what's going to happen to these people? I need to have another lawyer there that knows what's going on, my caseload, who's paid and who hasn't, whose files are where. Um, just as another level of customer service, I have to scale to develop the service I need um, because uh, because if something happens to me, it's a it's a big problem for other people's lives. So um, it wasn't even necessarily all the way about making more money. It was about how could I, again, deliver better service to people than I am now. Uh, and there's there's a lot more stuff, but I'll, I'll stop there because I, I could talk nonstop about this stuff. No, I, you 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 added a lot of really great points, and uh, I think uh, the thing that sticks out to me is just uh, you know idea of delivering great customer service before thinking about how that necessarily is scalable, um, and that's really the foundation of a of a great firm. And I think people are, from my experience, um, you know, working with with different immigration firms. We can send all the leads in the world, but if you you know you don't pick up the phone quickly, they're moving on, right? Or if they don't, if you don't answer their questions or get back to them uh, quickly, you know there there's so many other options out there that just kind of basic customer services uh, can be like the ultimate marketing hack, I think. And you know, and then of course you get into a different uh, you know different phase where you are trying to scale, and that brings its own challenges and. Um, how to kind of, you know, multiply yourself, right? And we're we're right in the same, uh, you know, I can certainly sympathize with that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I love the love the philosophy. Um, Thank you. 